Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Innovation Zero, the uh, finance and reporting forum. Uh, you're very welcome. I'm sorry it's standing room only, but trust me, this will be a, this will be a cracker. It will be worth it. Um, if you're in the first session, uh, you'll know that I'm London born and bred. Um, my friends all supported Tottenham. My mum supported Chelsea. So for me, it had to be Arsenal. Um, it's great, Hannah, you're here. If you're a Man City fan, you might be more comfortable in another forum. Um, no hard feelings, but third in the Women's League and second in the Men's League, I think, this season, right? Fantastic. In fact, let's have a round of applause for Arsenal. Yeah, Mike, come on. There we go. <laughs> right, without further ado, uh, James Murray is the Editor-in-Chief of Business Green. Uh, James is going to uh, take us through, he's going to moderate this session very kindly. So, James, uh, over to you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Welcome all to uh, another busy um, standing room only session. Thanks very much uh, for joining us. Um, this session is on reporting with confidence. Um, obviously, you wouldn't want to be reporting without it. Um, executing emissions disclosure as a strategic advantage. And of course, this is the critical component of any emissions reporting effort. If you're not actually using it for something strategic and building an advantage, it is just a cost. It is just a compliance cost that will be shoved off to the back office and not treated at all seriously. It's only if you use the resulting data to get some kind of advantage in your business and accelerate your emissions reduction efforts, which we all desperately need to do, that it becomes useful. So hopefully over the next 45 minutes, we'll have some fantastic pointers on how to do that and avoid the trap of uh, reporting without purpose. Uh, we've got a delight, uh, fantastic uh, panel to joining us today. We have Hugo Himber, who is the founder and CEO of Carbon Responsible. Uh, then, as mentioned previously, we have Hannah Mansour, who is the interim director of ESG at Arsenal. Uh, and last but not least, we have Juliana Victoria Chan, who is the manager at Horizon Capital. Welcome all. Um, Hugo, I'm going to come to you just to start with. Just give us the big picture elevator pitch on why reporting matters. Because for, you know, some businesses have legal requirements to do so, but lots of other smaller businesses don't yet have to do this. What, why should we be reporting on our emissions? I think that at the very um, beginning, it's the bedrock of everything that takes you from nowhere to full decarbonization. And the advantages that you get along the way, aside from some of the compliance and regulatory pieces that we're seeing, are also the ability to communicate what you're doing with confidence, um, clearly um, being able to report um, your progress to uh, any targets is rooted in measurement. and. Alongside that, some of the advantages that can be gained from a decarbonisation strategy actually include, to your point, James, about compliance cost, um, are very much rooted in operational cost savings. If you're reducing carbon, you're reducing cost at the rate of in, ex in excess of £1,000 a tonne um, in scope one and two in the UK today. I think you just mentioned the compliance component there. I mean, obviously, the regulatory pressure is ratcheting up all the time globally. I think just this week, the government launched a new call for evidence on non-financial reporting disclosures. We've got net zero transition plans rules coming into play very soon. Um, it's, it's only heading in one direction, the legal requirements and legislative requirements on businesses. Hugely so. And um, you know, looking back over the last 10 years that Carbon Responsible have been doing this type of work, I think we've probably seen more legislation, more compliance, both coming in in the last 12 months and also being heralded to come in in the next 24. So there is a huge amount of compliance requirement. And we're seeing that not just in, um, in regulatory reporting, we're seeing that in the finance sector, we're seeing that around consumer, um, and particularly the ASA now deciding that the use of things like carbon neutral and net zero on an unsupported basis are not a good idea. Um, so we're seeing a lot of this happening, and it's very real. It is now. So measurement is one of the first things that people need to be able to address this coming um, onrush of regulation. Absolutely. Um, Hannah, was that, you know, someone working at the, you, well, we need to update these terms. I was going to say at the coalface. We absolutely need to update these terms for the, uh, for the clean age. But, but for someone who's working on this directly, I mean, how did your journey start? What was the, what was the motivation for starting a, a reporting push? Um, so I think it was probably twofold. So um, Arsenal Football Club has done a lot in uh, sort of taking responsibility for its impact on a social perspective and also more recently from an environmental point of view. But I think there were sort of two key drivers for why we started to do more reporting. One was um, sort of that sense of responsibility, understanding that as a as a 
football club with an enormous global brand and massive global following, you know, we have a responsibility to be doing the right thing and um, using our platform in a way that encourages others to also take that journey. Um, and secondly, was to, because of the opportunity. So we're not yet uh, experiencing the regulatory pressure. Um, we're a privately owned business. Our um, income hasn't been sufficient to sort of mandate a lot of the reporting. Um, but actually, the opportunity is massive. You know, we rely on commercial sponsors for a big part of our revenue. And increasingly, they're looking to partner with organizations that show meaningful action in this space. And so for me, meaningful action starts with really understanding the data and being able to report and be transparent about what we're doing. So that, that, that's really interesting. So even as a business without kind of shareholders or, or, or a listing and that kind of investor pressure that we've heard so much about, you could still build the business case for doing this. You still saw the benefits of saying we need to know where our emissions are sourced are coming from. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, we've got multiple stakeholders for whom this is an interesting conversation for us to have. So I've mentioned sponsors as obviously our supporters. And um, we also have a really close relationship with our local authority, um, you know, for whom we have uh, dependency on to, in order to be able to run events at mm. Emirates Stadium. And, you know, obviously that's something that may look to um, change and increase over time. And the local authority have a very strong agenda around um, emission and reduction. And so as a kind of core business within that area, mm. You know, we also see that as an opportunity. So the business case still needs to be there for the significant investment needed to make the changes. But yeah. the appetite is certainly strong for us to take a leadership position. Absolutely. Um, Juliana, um, very different business for Rising Capital, um, obviously in the, in the investment space. I mean, can you, similar question to you. Can you just give us a quick overview of your, your journey on, in terms of your emissions reporting and, you know, where, where you're at currently? Yeah, of course. So we are a private equity fund. So as you say, we operate in the finance space. And uh, we started working on our carbon emission uh, calculation in 2020 uh, with the help and support of Carbon Responsible and Hugo. And for us at the time, you know, the regulatory pressure wasn't exactly there yet. It has actually soared in the last three years. But at the time, we saw it as an opportunity to differentiate ourselves from some of the other funds and our competitors. Mm. So being quite proactive. But what we've experienced really in the last three years has been a, a significant increase of uh, pressures from our institutional investor base. Uh, if I give you an example, um, we actually were fundraising at the end of 2020, beginning of 2021, and uh, the number of requests that we were receiving back then were very um, high-level requests, questions like, what is your ESG strategy? Um, you know, what are your thoughts on the net zero? Um, will you be calculating your carbon emissions? And if I look at fast forward 12 months, when we were towards the end of the fundraising cycle, the level of detailed questionnaires that I was receiving, the number of calls, meetings that I was required to attend, it was all about the data, all about the methodology used and much, much more thorough investigation had been done. So really in a short period of time, we went from a much ticket box exercise. We were kind of at the forefront or trying to be proactive to this is a real evaluation exercise and, you know, we're glad we actually kicked mm. off this journey and, and we were already on it. So, that, I mean, that's, again, fascinating to hear because there's, there's arguments in some parts of the press that this is a bit of, you know, this is greenwashing exercise, that investors are just polishing their halo. They're not really that interested in, in you know, as long as you've got a, a, a nice glossy document, it's fine. But, but your experience is that, no, they are asking detailed questions. They want to see the carbon footprint. They want confidence that you understand where your emissions are coming from. I knew you were going to ask me this, yeah. really, <laughs> finance. Uh, yeah, I would have to say uh, definitely it, it has shifted mm. because the regulation has helped. You know, we, uh, as everyone will be aware, the market regulators are releasing tighter guidelines and it's becoming more and more difficult to misinterpret the guidelines and actually commit greenwashing. So our investors are more aware and more knowledgeable, and so are we. And, mm. and overall, there is an, in, uh, an increasing level of, of responsibility and transparency yeah. in this world. Absolutely. Now, encouraging trends that we're seeing right across the piece. Um, Hugo, I'll come, I'll come to you. Let's, let's talk a little bit about what we're actually talking about in practice here. I mean, what does good reporting look like, and, and how can you start to leverage it so that you are getting that strategic advantage that this, uh, this session is about? I think my, oh, I'm afraid it's, it, it's one of those things that if you're, you're starting the journey, it's quite it's a complicated um, piece to start. 
but you're looking to get the most comprehensive assessment of the data that you have to be able to report that out um, and then to be able to use that in a way um, that is going to satisfy both the needs of, for example, investors or consumers, and that data has to be good. Um, I think we've now started to pass the point where just having numbers was enough. People want to know that those numbers are actually um, of, at an audit level of measurement rather than just simply something that somebody calculated on an Excel um, in half an hour. So it's important that we have um, measurement that is very, very strong. Once that is in place, you're then in a position to do things like set baselines, begin net zero um, targeting, and to evolve detailed roadmaps. Um, you can't start that process if the data is not good. Um, and sometimes that can be a bit of a journey, um, as I think both Juliana and also Hannah would attest to. Um, it, it can take 12 to 18 months to get to a really, really robust level of reporting mm. because it's complicated. And a lot of that data may not be held very easily by a company. But once you've got it, you're then able to control and manage a whole range of impacts that you have and start to effectively reduce. Mm. Um, let's dig into some of those challenges for a minute. I mean, Hannah, come to you. What, what were the biggest typical journalist asking the, the questions about the things that went wrong? But what, what were the biggest kind of challenges, the biggest pitfalls that, that you faced as you were going through that, that reporting exercise? I mean, I think Hugo sort of hit the nail on the head around availability of data. Um, we, um, you know, as a, as a club, we have, we've grown, although we're obviously a very old club and have been around for a long time, actually the rate of growth in recent time has been quite quick. Mm. And we've got incredibly sophisticated and mature data capabilities when it comes to football. Um, but, you know, the kind of business systems are... Uh, running to catch up to make sure that we've got the like, same um, level of data and to enable kind of effective decision making in other parts of the organisation. So for us, the big challenge has been data, and that's both data that obviously we can find and own ourselves. But then when we look across scope three, that is also then looking at dependencies on others to give us that data. So mm -hmm. fan travel is a big part of our scope three emissions. You know, trying to understand that is is quite difficult, and we're reliant on engaging with our supporters, um, you know, asking them questions, trying to understand sort of how they're traveling to games, both home and away, to get help build up that picture. And then the other, other kind of big area is around our supply chain. And um, I guess like many organizations, we have a, a, a kind of list of suppliers, as long as you're on, we probably most of the money with the top sort of proportion and then a very, very long tail. Mm. Um, but I think when we first looked into it, there was very few of those that were doing any sort of official reporting that we could, um, we could draw on. So again, that's another kind of challenge is how to engage our suppliers in a way that makes that easier to do. And how do you start to engage with that challenge? Because I mean, I suppose one of the questions here is kind of how deep into that supply chain are you? Do you need to go? Are you willing to go? I mean, you, you, are you ever going to get to the point where you're asking, I suppose, for the energy bills of the guy who sells the scarves outside the yeah. stadium? I mean, it's got, <laughs> you, you could go to the nth degree on this stuff, couldn't you? Do you how, where, how do you decide where to draw that line? Yeah, I mean, I'm a pragmatist, so I think I won't be going to ask the bloke who's selling scarves outside the stadium, his energy, em his emissions. But um, I mean, I think we're looking at it in two ways. So there's obviously the how much do you spend with them, but um, and Hugo's uh, and his team are sort of educating us a lot on this as we go. There's how much do you spend with them, but then that, they, that might not necessarily mean that those are our biggest emitting suppliers. It, so we sort of need to look at it from both lenses. Mm. Um, I think it's also about baking it into the process for the future. So ensuring that as part of our procurement process, when we sign up a new supplier, you know, we're kind of requesting their reporting as part of that process because we're all kind of looking at it backwards now, but actually embedding some of those um, hmm. sort of improvements for the future will help a lot as well. Absolutely. Um, Juliana, and obviously as, as a, as you say, as a private equity firm, you, you're, you're another step up. You, you've got to ask companies in your portfolio, presumably. I mean, how, how do you go about, well, in get, making that engagement, getting that, that whole process underway? Because there's so many different areas in your footprint that you could, you could report on. Yeah, absolutely. I think for um, private equity houses, uh, their portfolio companies is the largest category uh, mm. of emissions for sure. And we uh, personally have been doing this now since 2020. When we originally uh, started doing the exercise, we looked, took the backward approach looking at the year 2020 and the year 2021, which was ongoing. And therefore, 
the kind of challenges that we faced were uh, the fact that our reporting cycle at that point was too long. We were asking for data once a year mm -hmm. and the data quality wasn't there because it was very difficult for companies to, you know, look back at what they were doing in January when it was December because the right systems were in place. So with the help of um, Hugo, what we did we to tackle the data quality and the data gaps that we were seeing is, first of all, we shortened our reporting cycle. We went from yearly to quarterly, and that massively helped our portfolio companies increase the quality of their data because we had the opportunity to partway through the year, challenge the data that they were submitting and, you know, request for evidence and, and support them to, to improve on that. And on the data gaps, uh, you know, if you think about, uh, if you're trying to ask your portfolio companies about train tickets that uh, they purchased two months ago when their employees went to, let's say, a conference, mm. but there isn't the right expense system or HR system in place to record the key data that we need from a carbon emission standpoint, which is obviously mm. the class of this ticket is a standard, is a business, where and to where you're traveling from. All this information is going to be very onerous to find mm. once the moment has passed. But, but of course it is somewhere. That must be part of the frustration is that there is an expense system that somewhere is recording it. Yeah, but you would be surprised how high level that is. It might mm. just include the price and that is yeah. not enough from a carbon emission standpoint for us to do much, uh, much with it. Mm. So it's about aligning your systems and that's the exercise that we've been doing. And the lucky thing with private equity is the majority of the time you're holding a majority stake in the business. So you really have a say uh, in, in an opportunity to influence the decision making around their systems and processes. And that's what we do is we mm. try to help them and support them align these systems so we can get the best data. Yeah. We try, uh, no? Yeah. You guys. That's, <laughs> that's, that's interesting. So the companies, obviously, you know, as you're the main owner, they're not in a position to say, no, I think that's irrelevant. You're saying, no, this is, and they have to go away and and yeah. deliver it. And obviously we talk to, you know, if I look at portfolio companies, you'll have the enthusiasts that, you know, might be already be thinking about this before we even engage with them. And on the other end of the spectrum, you'll have the more cynical mm. that are like, why are we doing this? We're such a small company. We're not really yeah. making a, a big impact. And then you'll have people in the middle and it's all about taking founders, owners, and management teams through this journey mm. of, uh, uh, increasing awareness. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Hugo, just one last question on the challenges. I mean, anything else to add from that? Are the, uh, presumably these are quite familiar stories for lots of businesses that these are where the challenges lie. The, Any other areas you'd advise people to look out uh, for? The, they will be, and I think that you, we've heard very clearly what the main problems are, but being able to... Oh. Sorry, being able to extract data from systems um, is not something that's too difficult to do. I mean, we can quite often take anything up to a million rows of data and formatted um, structure and then extract what we need. So we use a combination of our own portals and tools and APIs and databases, but we're trying to make that process as easy as possible. So even if the data isn't great at the beginning, it's still mm. possible to work with a reasonable amount of it. Yeah. And I, I think to, to your question to, to Hannah about how far do you go into, for example, a supply chain and what is reasonable, at the outset, there has to be a degree of proportion, materiality. There is also a question of how much data you can get and also then what it's reasonable to estimate. So Juliana has mentioned that sometimes price data isn't enough, which it isn't for a lot of travel records. We've tried to plot this and tried to find patterns in it, but it doesn't really work. You need to know at the very least where someone's come from, where they're going to. Um, and that data, as I say, can be delivered to us in an unstructured form or uploaded into portals to do that. Um, but we're there, and, and I think this is the only way this works. We'll see a lot of solutions fledging in the marketplace that say that they will take out all of your data, produce a beautiful report. It's never quite that easy. So for us, it's um, certainly a degree of hand-holding um, and supporting right the way through that journey, and not just then delivering a report, but even beyond that report, there will continue to be questions and evolutions. Mm. Absolutely. Let's, um, let's pivot to talk about that, that beyond the reporting process and how you do actually get that strategic advantage. Um, I mean, Hannah, I'll come to you first. I mean, what, from your experience of this, I mean, how has how's this process helped? What has it, what has it tangibly resulted in? Because as we, as we set out from the outset, it, it, it's just a, it's just an exercise if you're not using the data properly at the end. Yeah, so I think there's probably a few different ways to answer that. I mean, one big thing it gives us is confidence. 
um, which is actually really important. So confidence in that we're making investments in things that are actually going to have a meaningful impact. Mm. Um, but also confidence in our ability to talk about it. It's, um, I'm sure many organisations are the same, but you know, it's a difficult conversation to have in some ways. And um, as a brand that's particularly open to scrutiny, I think on some of these topics, I'm sure people will have seen kind of recent press coverage. For us, it's really important to come from a position of authenticity. And so really understanding the data gives us the opportunity to say, we really know our impact. We've got a clear plan to reduce that because it's based on what the data is telling us, you know, where we need to make the biggest changes. And now we can have a different conversation, um, mm. you know, in the marketplace about that. That's interesting. So when, when for example, you, you know, you get hit in the press about, you know, well, all football clubs about flights and things like this, you, you, have, a, you have a way to say, look, we're aware, we are working on this. We, we have a, a long-term plan of sorts. Yeah, and I think you can have a different conversation. Player, we, we released a statement to the BBC when, uh, when there was a lot of scrutiny around player flights recently. Player flights make up less than a quarter of a percent total emissions. Mm. Um, we recognise it's an incredibly visible um, thing, and so it's something that we do need to address. Our, our players have only flown three times this season, um, but you know, there are other demands on players from performance, schedule, etc., uh, that make it difficult to avoid. Plus, maybe someone could just improve trains in the UK so we don't <laughs> need to fly. <laughs> um, but yes, it means we can have a different conversation because we understand the impact that those flights have. And whilst you know we're not ignoring that and saying we, that's not something we're going to mm. address, we will. But there's a lot more we need to do as well. And just very quickly, you mentioned that's only a very small percentage. Um, what other areas did you find that are the hot spots? Are the areas that now you're prioritising where you realise maybe people weren't aware, but there's there's a big footprint there? I mean, our biggest area, as most um, sports organisations, is how our fans travel, uh, both to home games and away games. Um, so that's, that's a real opportunity for us to look at that. And we're very fortunate as a London-based club to have great public transport um, options for people to be able to travel to match days. Um, so that's definitely a big focus. But um, you know, beyond that, I suppose, really, it's about Skate 1 and 2, and where we can most have, have the most influence over what we do. And mm. um, we might come on to this, but with energy being such a hot topic at the moment, obviously, there's a great opportunity to really look at that right now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it does point, but both transport and energy, it points to the way that the structural change has to happen around you. You can't do it all on your own. Yeah. Um, uh, Juliana, um, I mean, similar question to you. I mean, how, how have you found this exercise helping the business and, and, and giving you that strategic advantage that you're seeking? Well, in, in the finance world, obviously, larger financial institutions are very open and public about their sustainability commitments, and, and they release statements um, and, and reports on their websites and in a number of, of uh, panels. When you think about smaller outfits um, like Verizon Capital, for example, you won't uh, see them as public and open as these um, bigger financial institutions because ultimately from a regulatory standpoint, we're not required to. But that doesn't mean that under the hood things are not happening. We are seeing uh, a lot of pull and a lot of opportunity to differentiate ourselves from our uh, competitors through sustainability. So I think this has been the biggest realization is all the data that we have collected and the emissions that we've calculated, whilst we're not being probably as open and public as some of our larger institutional uh, partners, we are finding that this is very helpful for us to differentiate ourselves with our employees, which, you know, when we are in hiring processes, are increasingly more interested in knowing what the fund is doing with their sustainability, but also with the founder owners out there that are seeking investment. You know, you'd be surprised how, you know, in the last couple of years, they are increasing the requests about how are we going to help them get on a decarbonization strategy. And they might be already coming to us with some of these elements of the puzzle and looking for us mm. to help them uh, figure it out. And that's, you know, when we turn to also our own advisors and, and, and it becomes a, a, a conversation. So I would say whilst we're not as public, it, it really is a differentiator. Yeah. And, and I mean, how does that manifest itself practically? So obviously we're here at Innovation Zero, we've got the, the, the net zero targets, everyone's working towards the financial sector. A lot of companies saying they want to get net zero portfolios by 2040 or 2050. Um, how do you then take that data and turn it into or, or use it to shape a, a net zero transition plan? So we are in that process. Uh, we're actually in the process of uh, setting targets ourselves. Hmm. So with uh, um, Carbon Responsible, we've been working over the last three years on 
gathering the data and improving the data, but now we're at that point where at least for scope one and two, we will be uh, agreeing on our baseline and setting some short-term net zero targets. But uh, as Hugo knows, data quality, and uh, obviously to set a baseline, you need to be comfortable with the data. And data quality is something I personally always uh, struggle to get comfortable with, and probably other people here in the room will feel the same. Like you always feel like you could be doing better and you could be doing more and more and more accurate. So it's really a, a fine uh, trading line. Uh, for me personally, I focus on what I can control. So that is supporting our portfolio companies, making sure they have the right tools and the right um, partners to, to be doing the best possible capture uh, of information that they can. And ultimately, that is, is key, but also making sure that you're being quite descriptive with your data. Sometimes less is more mm. uh, when it comes to emissions. So um, scope three, for example, at least in the type of businesses that we um, invest, it's the majority of, uh, of the impact mm. rather than scope one and, and two. And therefore, you know, there's a whole host of uh, categories out there, but starting with the more meaningful and material ones and then gradually adding to that whilst you increase the quality of the data of your initial categories is the approach that we have taken. To give you an example, you talked about suppliers. We started actually our supplier analysis last year, but um, after a year of, of capturing data, we're not that satisfied with the, you know, the, the engagement. So the next 12 months for us is going to be like improving the communication with our suppliers and making sure we nail that category before we think about adding anything else and that way we keep our portfolio focused mm. and deliver better quality yeah. reporting absolutely um hugo what's what's coming down the track what's what the next sort of, i mean you mentioned i think previously the next sort of 12 24 months there's a lot more investor pressure a lot more regulatory pressure i mean how do you how do you see this market evolving in in the coming months and just before you answer i was going to say um <laughs> we'll take some questions shortly so if anyone wants to answer questions through slido or indeed stick their hands up. Um, yeah, have a good thing for a good question. Um, Hugo. So I think you've, you've, you've um, touched on targets and why targets are important. And I think in, you know, for in the last two years, we've had a lot about targets and people setting targets. One of the things that has been absent quite in quite a lot of cases around targets is um, proper roadmaps, full profiling of data, understanding what that means and how it's going to play out over a period of time. So I think one of the things we're definitely going to see more of um, is more scrutiny around the numbers and what people are doing. Certainly in the investment world, larger investors are now pressuring the largest companies to tell them you know, what they're doing um, to get to net zero, how much it's going to cost, um, you know, how fast are they going to get there. So that's happening from an investor point of view. I think consumers are very much interested in where brands are going as they start to, as we start to see an unraveling of greenwashing, whether accidental or deliberate, and we're, that's coming through in both European and UK legislation. Hmm. So that's, uh, again, a focus around having good numbers, doing the right thing. Um, so it's all about getting better at this, being more transparent and um, actually evidencing progress rather than simply evidencing either a set of numbers or a target. It's really interesting, though, you mentioned the sort of the people asking questions about the cost and, and how we can do this. I mean, obviously, one of the huge challenges for this whole space mm -hmm. is how you make the business case when you know the considerable upfront investments in a lot of the clean technologies that we need um, and obviously currently um, regardless of the minister's slightly panglossian view of things this morning mm. the economic outlook isn't as positive as we might all like and a lot of businesses a lot of people who work in sustainability say time and time again we know what we want to do it's building the business case it's making convincing the cfo to do it how can this reporting process and this data process help with that and help you know, get over those financial barriers that are so often delaying the investments and the deployments that I imagine virtually 99% of people who are attending here today okay. to the make. Very, there is a very simple answer to that. When we do any reporting, we look at two outputs beyond the carbon. One is what it's costing our clients to actually create those emissions in the first place and also the risk cost of carbon in relation to potential um, tax regimes. When we look at um, you know, what that cost is against the trajectory that we can see could be achieved quite realistically, you're looking at some very big cost savings. I mean, for one of our clients, that we identified savings that ran into millions of pounds. That makes what we do largely um, a free ride mm. um, for clients in that sense once they're starting to decarbonize. 
So I think it's possible to um, you know, uh, over-exaggerate how onerous the cost of the business case is. Um, and, and it's certainly not something that we're experiencing a huge amount of because I think people can see where they can unlock the value. Mm. And that's intangible value, not just in the intangibles around brand or anything else that they may gain benefits from. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Hannah, Julian, do you have any examples of how you've helped use this data to help build that business case and make, make some investments? And um, maybe mix up the order. I'll come to you first, Juliana, this time. Yeah, I think... Oh. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's really about you need to understand who you're speaking to. You mentioned CFO. A CFO will have a very, um, you know, different um, set of motivations from um, the CEO or the founder mm. of the business. You really need to, first of all, understand your audience and what is going to motivate that person. Um, for me, primarily speaking to our management teams and, you know, trying to first of all speaking to uh, the partners and, and, and within the firm internally but then also with them speaking to our management teams of the portfolio companies we always think about um, what is going to motivate those people and in the finance world you're always working towards an exit right like we hold businesses for a certain amount of years we help them grow but ultimately we're going to sell them on whether that is to a trade buyer or another private equity house so if we want to grow the business and grow its value, which is what people normally are uh, primarily incentivized, we need to build the business case about ESG sustainability and the lowering of your emissions. It's going to help you achieve that goal. Mm. So I think that's the kind of perspective I take. I always think about who's my audience, what's going to motivate that person, and uh, provide clear examples of how yeah. we're going to achieve it's that. It's fascinating. So much of the climate debate does come down to that sort of communications and positioning, that human touch alongside all the data and the technology. Um, Hannah, similar question to you. I mean, any, any examples of way, how this has helped you build that business case and get projects happening? Well, I think it's, um, I mean, Hugo made the point, you know, actually there are genuine cost savings that can be had by looking at some of these areas. For us, you know, we have a big facility that we run um, that is obviously a big, uh, has a big demand for energy and that's a key contributor to our emissions. You know, where the business case is very straightforward to get CFO buy-in is where you're showing emission reduction aligned with cost savings, which, you know, we are doing for a number of um, projects that we're running at the moment that are focused on sort of energy efficiency or energy reduction within the stadium. Mm. Um, so then you get the kind of win-win, which I think is the ideal business case for everybody. And, you know, I think with the price of energy fluctuating so much as it has recently, the business case has become easier to prove that some of that upfront kind of capex investment required to make those changes is actually going to pay dividends in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've got about 10 more minutes. Any questions from the floor at this stage? I'm a, I'm a journalist. I can keep asking questions forever. I'll just uh, <laughs> st keep you here for the next 20 minutes. Um, sorry, gentlemen here. Um, I think there's a roving mic, but if not, you can shout. No, you, we have a roving mic. There you go. Thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, if you could introduce yourself as well, that'd be yeah, great. Thank so you. My name is Emilian. I'm the impact manager for uh, Ocean Bottle. We're a um, reusable bottle company that funds plastic collection with every product that we sell. Um, so as a football club, obviously your community is a lot more, I mean, a lot bigger and a lot more diverse than most companies, and you're under probably a lot more public scrutiny than most companies. How, um, could you tell us a bit more about how you go about educating your audience about the decisions that you're making, and how you go about you know, getting everybody on board because your community is so much bigger and so much wider than most? Mm. That's a fascinating question. Is, is the average Arsenal football fan interested in this Should stuff? And if, if, and if not, how do you engage them? Yeah. Um, so, I think, yeah, what is the average Arsenal football fan is probably the response to that yeah, question. Definitely. There's 85 million of them around the world, so there probably isn't such a thing as an average. But, um, I mean, I think to your point, like, that's the biggest opportunity we probably have as a, fo as a football club because we have a different relationship with supporters that are... We, that's why we don't call them consumers. Like the relationship is completely different to what other brands have with their with their customers, um, and so our the greatest impact ultimately we can have is how we educate, inform, encourage, inspire, celebrate kind of our supporters who are taking action with us. Um, but that needs to come from a position of authenticity. So for us, it's about this kind of say do balance. You know, we want to make sure that the do is always greater than the say so that, um, you know, we're not just asking of our fans something that we're not willing to do ourselves. So that's part of it. And then I think, um, you know, we're at the beginning of a journey on this. And as we as we um, continue, 
sort of thinking about how we can engage them through the conversation we have with our players, you know, what we say as a brand, kind of their experience when they interact with us, whether that's on a match day coming to a game or through our store or just even in our kind of online channels. You know, we need to find ways to kind of sow the seeds. The slight challenge I think we have as well as a sort of um, Premier League football club is you ask to stand for everything and there is always a match for a, uh, you know different causes and they're all amazing causes but how do you just make sure there's not so much noise that some of these messages kind of get lost in mm, it? Absolutely. I've um, got a really interesting question here, a bit of, um, here we go, acronym, uh, pop quiz on acronyms for you all. Um, TCFD, SBTI, yeah. SECR, <laughs> Uh, there are so many reporting structures. We could add to that. I think uh, just today on Business Green, we're talking about the Task Force for Nature-related financial disclosures, which has just issued some guidance. We have the International Sustainability Standards Board that has a big report coming out this summer. Um, we obviously have the Net Zero Transition Plan that the government is moving towards and is going to be consulting on. Um, uh, the list goes on and on and on. And the question here from Joanna Sibwell is, which is best and how can I report efficiently when there is this you know, this, this acronym soup of different <laughs> standards and approaches. Um, yep. Hugo, you have to wade through this every day. I mean, what, what's your take <laughs> on, on, on this challenge? Because it's a significant challenge for businesses. So it is a challenge. And what we're, what we're always trying to do is to, is to break that down. Some of the data that is used in all of these um, reporting formats is common. So it is possible for us to drive that out in lots of different ways. I think that the stage we're in is a very difficult one because if we go back three years, there was virtually nothing. Now everybody wants to create a standard in their industry, in their country, and that may not be um, just consumer, it could be finance. So there are a range of different things that are coming in. Everyone has done them slightly independently. There has to be a hope at some point that there will be more coalescence. And this is the question that keeps on coming up about the FCA's guidelines and what you know, we as a business think about those. There, there isn't enough alignment, but it will get there. Um, in the interim, picking the one that is right for you, some of that's driven by um, compliance. So if you're a large company, you'll use SECR. We report all of our, um, we make all of our reports SECR compliant anyway. If you're looking at a framework that best describes how you manage your business in relation to what you're doing, ECFD is a very good framework. Um, it's only required for those very large companies or those with very large assets. But it, the framework of it is something that we like because it talks to risk, to governance, to metrics, to targets. So it's, it's about how you do it, not just what your numbers are and whether you've got a target. And that, that's, you know, that is increasingly something that's recognized in lots of different parts of the world. So it's cross-jurisdictional quite well. Um, mm. But there is going to be a lot more. It will coalesce. Um, it isn't as painful as it sounds when you actually look at what you're having to report out, which is often the same numbers in different formats. In indeed. Um, yeah, anything to add? Sorry. I gonna, oh. Sorry. I was going to add that when you look at these um, frameworks and you strip them down, at the end of the day, it, it all comes down to, uh, first of all, your common emissions. So kicking off that exercise, if you haven't, is probably the first step that you want to be thinking about before you even look at, uh, at frameworks. And then obviously there's gonna be elements of uh, governance in there. So just having a look at what are the pillars of, for example, TCFD and making sure you are um, slowly but steady getting the data that you need and the systems in place, ultimately when the regulation will hit you, you'll be mm. in, a, in such a better spot Absolutely. than your competitors. Um, I've got a really interesting question here. Um, uh, Juliana, I'll come to you with first on this, but someone's asking what degree of importance does carbon reporting have in analyzing asset risk? And um, we could have a whole other session on stranded asset risk and the carbon bubble, which is an area I'm, I'm genuinely fascinated about. And if you haven't if you haven't looked at the work of Carbon Tracker, I would advise that you do so because it's, it's really, really important stuff. But does, does this feed into, you know, how you analyse the risk that certain companies, particularly in carbon intensive sectors, could be facing? Yeah. Um, so at Horizon, because of the nature of the businesses we invest in being primarily B2B service and technology, it's not something we have directly um, experienced so far. However, I have noted some of our um, competitors that focus in more like industrials or more, you know, carbon heavy industries. They are taking into account the EBITDA, so, you know, the, the, the profits of the business and they are looking at how carbon costs impact that and also the multiples, so the valuation the businesses are trading at 
the multiple is having um, some fluctuations based on uh, carbon cost and carbon opportunity. So it's definitely something that is getting more literate within finance, but I wouldn't say there is a, 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 a standardized uh, uh, approach yet. Hugo, with some of your other clients, I mean, how, how big a factor is that looking at this, th these risks that now come with carbon intensive businesses? So I, in, in any business, certainly, we're, we're starting to see a, you know, um, some of the, uh, some investment um, firms starting to look at carbon premiums in businesses, particularly around M&A. And obviously, the risk that um, we're, we're talking about, there's a lot of corporate risk in, you know, uh, you know potentially having a, a, a non-reduction offset driven strategy, for example, not having good numbers. Um, being inefficient with resources, which could relate to return on investment calculations. There's a lot of real activity in, in, in this um, mm. that we're starting to see um, from people who are involved in the, as I say, in the M&A space. Yep, absolutely. Um, we've got a, uh, one further question here on scope three reporting. Somebody asking, is it compulsory now? And um, I, I don't think, I mean, it's not technically fully compulsory, but if not, when do we expect it to become compulsory? Um, Hugo, I suppose that's a question to start with you on again, but you know there, yeah. there does seem to be a movement towards this. But then, as we've discussed, it's huge. It's the most complex part of this challenge, and in some ways, almost impossibly so. Yes, I mean it's always talked about as being highly complex, and therefore we shouldn't make it mandatory, and we can't do it. I don't necessarily believe in that, given you know experience of Scope Three over a long period of time. Um, obviously, one and two is is mandatory because there is a you know more direct control. But even within the 15 categories of scope three, there are some that are slightly more easy to do and more pertinent than others. You don't necessarily need to have got to all 15 from a standing start. You could start to um, you know, measure and also make targets around them. Um, th making that mandatory is in all of these frameworks. It's encouraged everywhere, but it's not mandatory. It will become um, difficult to mandate that, I think, mm. in the short term. But Again, when you look at companies and you're comparing companies like for like and what people are doing, somebody who is just standing in the, in the marketplace and saying we only report one and two because we have to, um, probably not going to be doing the best mm. for themselves, their stakeholders, investors and consumers. Mm. But, but Hannah, this is quite a difficult part of it, isn't it? Because obviously it's not mandatory, but within things like the science-based targets initiative, it is, it's required that you have a, a scope three target and, and as you mentioned it's 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 the really tricky part of it. I mean is, is there a risk that some companies could be put off with engaging through through that complexity or, or from your experience is it manageable is it something you can work your way through yeah, oh I think I fail, have I? oh can you hear me there, there, there it is sounds yeah. back there we go I think because I keep turning it's all coming off um is it manageable? I mean, I think it is very difficult and we've certainly found it very difficult. I don't think that's a reason necessarily not to do it. I think it's, um, you know, it's important to engage in it. I, I think, um, uh, you know, we just also have to, my mantra is sort of don't let perfection get in the way of progress. I mean, I think it's very difficult to get perfect data in scope three in particular. Um, but equally, you can probably get a pretty good sense of where the big emissions are coming from quite quickly. Mm. And so then the key for me is to start shifting towards well, what can we meaningfully do to start to make changes in those spaces. Mm. And, th and then that's the key part, isn't it? Working with your suppliers to say, hang on, you're a, you're a hotspot for us. If you want our business, exactly. we, we need to work together to tackle this. Exactly. Absolutely. Excellent. Um, we are nearing the end of our session. Any last very quick questions from the floor? No? Okay, so the last question is what... We're, you know, we're on track for net zero by 2050, 2040. You know, it, it, it seems a long way off, but it is for many businesses, it's one investment cycle, two investment cycles at most. And for most of the people in this room looking around here, yeah, you will, you'll, you'll still be around. Hope, <laughs> hopefully, fingers crossed. I, I, mean, I, I get very cross about this. Somebody once said that when Theresa May passed the net zero law into a into thing, they were always saying, what will she care? She'll be dead by then. And I, I looked up how old she is and it's like, She'll be, oh yeah, she'll be like 93 in 2050. But, you know, that's, you can do that now. That's, there's a reasonable chance she'll still be around to see if the law that she passed into, into fruition actually comes to pass. And we all have to hope that it does. And I think there's this, this sense, it seems a long way off, but it's actually remarkably close. So my question for the panel is, what do you think emissions reporting looks like in a net zero economy that hopefully we will be getting to in that sort of time frame? I mean, will this become something as ubiquitous as financial reporting or even more ubiquitous? It will just be on our phones. We'll be sort of trading emissions the whole time. How do you see this whole space 
panning out? And you, you have to answer that big question in approximately 30 seconds each. But there we go. Okay, so uh, in, hopefully we're not trading emissions on our phones. But in terms of where this is going, we can see where, from the Europeans that assurance around these numbers, audit quality, accounting practices, accounting standards are what this space will um, be needing, is starting to have, and will be the bedrock of how reporting goes forward. Absolutely. Hannah? Uh, if I'm honest, I'm not sure I've thought too much about reporting in 2050, but my um, sense would be, wouldn't it be great if we could have sort of real-time decision-making led by information about um, sort of emissions and emissions data, and so surely that's doable by 2050. Indeed, and, and maybe a, a working rail network as well. That would be yeah. a, a lovely <laughs> thing to, we can but dream. Um, and Juliana, finally. Uh, I think for us in the finance world, the importance is that we can come to agree on one uh, coherent way to report, and therefore it'll become easier to benchmark and, and position ourselves. Excellent, indeed. That's, again, something very practical that we need to see and hopefully will happen soon. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you to the panel uh, for a really fascinating discussion. Um, thank you all for uh, listening and for those questions. Hugely appreciated. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Um, of course, um, every day, check out Business Green and catch all your news in this very exciting space. And um, if you're enjoying Innovation Zero and the whole Net Zero uh, movement, then uh, you can also sign up to our Net Zero Festival, which is happening in October. So come to that too. Brilliant. Thank you all and um, see you later.